Today's scripture will be Proverbs chapter 31, verses 1 through 9. Again, it's Proverbs 31, 1 through 9. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. What are you doing, my son? What are you doing, son of my womb? What are you doing, son of my vows? Do not give your strength to women, your, uh, your ways to those who destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they forget what was decreed, and prevent the, or pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong, greed, give strong drink to the one who is perishing, and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink, forget their poverty, and remember their misery no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. As has been mentioned a couple times already this morning, uh, it's Mother's Day, a day that we want to honor those ladies who have served faithfully as mothers. Uh, it doesn't mean that you women who are not mothers are less worthy. We appreciate you as well. But our country set aside this day to, to honor mothers. But of course, our priority today is to glorify our Father. And so is, it a, is there a way that we can biblically uh, honor mothers and glorify our Father? I believe there is. And there's several ways in which we could do that and passages in which we could look and fantastic examples of godly women within scriptures. But I wanted us to look at Proverbs chapter 31. In Proverbs 31, a lot of times we think about this chapter automatically if we were to say a worthy woman or a woman who is uh, worth far above jewels or your Bible may say rubies uh, is what you've heard before. Uh, you would think of Proverbs 31 and but a lot of times in thinking that, we forget, maybe, uh, to whom it was said and from whom or by whom it was said. And I uh, wanted us to focus on that a little bit this morning and then take a look at the, the words that were said. You notice, as Noah read for us, that these were words that King Lemuel uh, set forth, but they were delivered by a godly mother. Let's don't lose sight of that, okay? What he is stating is what his mother told him. And so as we look here, uh, Lemuel, we don't know who he is. Now, you may have heard some people say that it's another name for Solomon um, and that this may be words that Bathsheba may have delivered to him. Look, there's no real evidence for that, okay? Um, like Edgar in the last chapter uh, and and and. Who knows if the mother loved him, giving him a name like that, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, in chapter 30, we listen about Edgar, and, and we don't know who he was either. So we really don't know who this King Lemuel was, uh, but it doesn't really matter if we know who he was or not. Uh, we listen to the words that his mother gave him, and, and good words and great advice for you and I today. And we begin, uh, notice what she says, verse 2. What, O oh my son, and what, son of my womb, and what, O oh son of my vows? This verse 2 is a sermon in and of itself, is it not? When you look where she's, she's saying to him and addressing him, son of my womb, uh, in the time in which our country is now embroiled in a fight again over abortion, we could spend a lot of time talking about that, we, couldn't we? But we won't. Uh, but she's pointing out that you're you're my son, you know. And and oftentimes, if if uh, you're a mother and you have a grown child, uh, you know your mom may use this against you when she's not quite happy with you. Eighteen hours I delivered you, boy, and you better act right. Well, fruit of the womb here. But also notice, and I think this is especially tender, son of my vows. And so before the child was conceived, what had she done? She had prayed for and asked for and made a vow to the Almighty. We can think of others in Scripture that did that, especially we think of Hannah, don't we? 
who went before Eli and and uh, she prayed and made a vow and said, God, if you, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. That's the idea here. So she's prayed for him before he ever saw the earth, before he ever set foot in this world. She had prayed for him and had plans for him. And certainly godly mothers will do that very thing. What did she tell him? And it's interesting here, uh, verse 3, uh, we're not talking about an infant child. We're talking about someone who is a king. And most likely, he is coming into uh, young adulthood, probably a teenager, maybe 15 or 16. You know, when we were all the smartest we ever were in life and, and knew it all. But he's about to take over and become king. He's going to have authority. He's going to have rule. He's going to have influence over uh, not just a few, but over many. How should a king act? And what would a godly mother say to a young man who, who is coming of age? Well, this is what she says to him. Don't give your strength to women or your ways to that which destroys kings. What is she saying here? Don't give your strength to women. Basically, in today's language, don't go chasing women to see how many you can sleep with. That's what she's saying, right? And she says, notice that that is the way that destroys kings. Can you think of a king by any chance in the Old Testament that did this very thing? We think of one in particular, I know. Solomon, right? 1 Kings chapter 11. 700 wives, 300 concubines. He did the very thing. She's saying, don't do it. Why? Well, we've got a good history lesson. Take a look at him. What did those 700 wives do? And those 300 concubines do? In 1 Kings 11 and verse 3, it says, they led his heart away from God. You want to talk about destroying a king? See how many women and notches you can put on your bedpost. Don't do that. Number two, what else is he to do? It's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. Why? For they will drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. So she moves from the women to alcohol. Boy, isn't that a combination? Isn't it still a combination today? What does she say? Look, if you're going to be a good king, you stay away from the alcohol. Don't go drinking. You look throughout Scripture again, and we can look in several places where this has been a problem, but I think of one in particular, and that is in the book of Esther. Do you remember the very beginning of the story? Where Xerxes or Ahasuerus, the king there, what happens? They're having a feast and a banquet, and specifically it's mentioned within there that everyone can have what they wanted to drink. There was no compulsion. And so after one day passed, and two days passed, and three days passed, seven days of getting sauced, what happens? Bring in, bring in my wife, she's pretty. We're going to show off her beauty before everybody. And this was a very normal tactic for the Persians. They would get drunk, and then they would have people sit in their midst, and all the drunk leaders would make decisions, and they would write those down, and when they sobered up, they would see what they had decided upon. Isn't this exactly what we see here? You're going to get drunk in a position of authority, and you're going to make decisions that are going to affect all of your subjects, and when you sober up and the hangover's over, you're going to realize, man, I really messed up there. If you want to be a good king, stay off the sauce. You don't drink. Stay away from it. Right? Now who's the wine for? The wine is for those people who are, who are dying. And why would it be for them? It's an anesthetic. 
when the man's dying, keep him comfortable, right? Let him drink. You make sure to keep him comfortable while he's on his way out so he can forget things. It's not a king has a, a free uh, uh, bar for the poor. That's not what's being said here, as some would like it to say. It's simply this. You, you're keeping the dying man, the dying poor fella, from suffering while he's on his way out. You want to be a good king, Lemuel? Stay away from the alcohol. Stay off the strong drink. And not only do you do that, here's what you need to do. Number three, you need to open your mouth. And you need to open your mouth and do the right thing with it. You need to open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of the unfortunate. Open your mouth and do this. Judge righteously. Defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. Here's what you do with your authority. Don't you find it amazing that in six short verses, this godly mother has <laughs> summed up the moral requirements of a good government. If I could take these six verses here and deliver them to Washington and have them follow them, what would our country look like? Right? You want to be a good and godly king, son, stay away from the women, stay away from the alcohol, and you stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves. That's what you do. Now, she moves on to another area to give some more advice, important advice, really, about the kind of woman you do want to look for. Okay? the kind of woman that, that you want to marry. And from verses 10 through 31, it's interesting, if, if you like digging in this type of thing, you may want to do it later on. In the, in the Hebrew language, this is an acrostic. There's 22 verses to it, and all 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are used at the beginning of each verse. It's also what's known as a chiasm or chiastic structure where it goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, G, H, whatever, backwards, I can't do it backwards. <laughs> but the point is it, it, it goes to a point and then it comes back. So you'll notice at the beginning of it sort of ends like, uh, and it ends sort of the same way it begins and, and builds upon itself. You can look at that later on. We don't need it for this morning. But she's going to give him advice now about the kind of woman that you want to look for. And he says this, an excellent wife who can find her worth is far above jewels. Now, she's not saying you can't find an excellent wife. Okay? When she says who can find, what she's saying is this is a very hard thing to do. It was hard back then. It's hard now to find an excellent woman, a worthy woman, right? It's difficult. And lest you think, women, that we're just pointing to you, back in chapter 20, we're told it's hard to find a good man too. Okay? It's hard to find one. It's hard to find a worthy woman. But if you do, her value, the value to you, right, is far above jewels, far above anything you can, you can calculate. Notice what happens when he finds this woman. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. And so in everything in life, in every aspect in life where she's involved with him, he trusts her completely. He doesn't think anything about it. He knows he can trust her. In fact, if you notice verse 12, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. Can you see how that would be more valuable than anything you could put a price on? She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. What does that look like? Well, what it looks like is the next few verses. Verse 13, here's what she does. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight or willingly. She works willingly. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it's still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. And so what's she doing? Well, she's going out 
early in the morning, isn't she? And she's busy uh, working with her hands willingly. She's, she's happy to work with her hands. And like merchant ships, of course, bringing in uh, goods to harbor, she's bringing in and making sure she's got food for her family. And not only that, she gets up early while it's still dark outside, and she gives food to her household, and she considers or uh, uh, and a portion to her maiden. So what's she doing? Remember now, if we think about it, and he's a king, and she's going to be a queen, isn't she? So what's she doing? She's running the house. She's doing her part. So these maidens that we read about here, she's making sure, number one, they're well taken care of. They get to eat as well. But two, she's making sure that before the sun comes up, they've been given all their tasks to make sure that things are going to go smoothly within the house. That's what she's doing. I sort of picture a, 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 a little bit of like a, a Downton Abbey in the morning. You've seen the show, right? Yeah. So she's down there making sure everyone's got food. Everyone's got their task done. But you know what? She's not done. She's not going back upstairs or, or into the house or wherever it may be to sit down. What does she do after this? Well, she heads out and she considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard, or, or from, uh, from the fruit of her hand, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength. She makes her arms strong. And so she's going out to conduct some business, isn't she? This, this woman knows a lot of things. I started making a list down in here. I've got, I've got chef, Management, real estate, agricultural, agriculture, textiles. She's benevolent. She knows fashion. She knows retail. She knows accounting. She knows bookkeeping. She knows stewardship. We could go on and on. This this woman's got it together. How in the world? How in the world could she not be a great wife? Right. So she goes out and she looks at this field. She knows how to look at the things around it. She understands how to value real estate. And she says, okay, this is a good deal. I'm going to take it. And she takes it. And then what does she do? She plants a vineyard in it. And that vineyard is going to reap fruit. And she's going to take the profits, and she's not going to go squander them. She uses the profits to help her family, to help them be rich. And so what does she do? This woman's not afraid to work. She girds, her, girds herself with strength, makes her arms strong. Literally, she girds up her loins with strength. The idea here, this is what we would, we would say in our modern language. She's got a strong back, and she's got strong arms, and she's not afraid to go use them. That's, that's what's being said here. And so she's out and she's working. And she senses that her gain is good. That is, what she's done has been profitable. It's been worthwhile. It wasn't a, a waste of time. It didn't put her family in, a, in harm's way or danger. It was a profitable investment. And so what happens? Her lamp doesn't go out at night. Now, I circled night in the two times that it's here. It's verse 15 and verse 18. And one is she's up but while it's still dark, and she stays up after it gets dark. I'm tired just reading it. So what does she do when she gets home after all this hard work? Well, she stretches out her hands to the distaff, and her hands or palms grasp the spindle. You're going to read her hands four times in these two verses. She extends her hand to the poor. She stretches out her hands to the needy. Now look what she does. After she gets home of working all day, she's going to make sure she, she's getting clothes put together. That's what she's doing. She's, she's weaving clothes, right? Well, she's weaving clothes, and as you follow along, we would think, well, she's getting ready for the next day as well. She's putting clothes together, but notice this. As great as she is, and as hardworking as she is, she wants to take care of her family, and as industrious as she is, as, as this uh, working woman who is obviously bringing in some coin for the house, right? <clears throat> she's not greedy. She's not selfish. And all these things. She's, she's not doing these things to be selfish. She's not doing these things to pad her own pocketbook. Notice that she is not, uh, she extends her hand to the poor. She looks at people that are less fortunate. 
She looks at people who haven't had the opportunities that she has had. She looks to people who don't have any money, and what does she do? She gives some of that hard-earned money to them because she cares about them, because she's a compassionate woman. She stretches out her hands to the needy. She's going to give to people who need, who need help. Can't we appreciate that? Certainly we can. And isn't that really a picture of what God wants from each one of us? And if you were to go back and read Deuteronomy chapter 15, you find out she's falling right in line with exactly what God wanted from these women and from Jews. Well, she's not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen, fine linen and purple. So what are we seeing here? She's not worried about the snow and her, her clothes are made out of scarlet. You'll read some commentators say different thing, things about it. But the idea is this, that her kids are dressed in the highest quality clothing that there is. It's one reason she's out working so hard, to make sure that her little ones, her kids, her children can be clothed well. And not only is she someone, we may get the picture of, of uh, this uh, rugged woman that doesn't have soft hands and works all the time, but I don't think that's the picture of what we're seeing in verse 22. I think what we're seeing here, she makes coverings for herself. And what does her clothing look like? Does it look like burlap and potato sack? No. Her, her clothing's fine linen and purple. This is an elegant woman. She knows how to carry herself. And here's, here's what I see in, in the quick things of it. Uh, I'm going to make sure that my family's got food. I'm going to make sure my husband looks sharp. I'm going to make sure my kids look sharp. And I'm going to make sure I look sharp. And people are going to see that we care. That's what she's doing. She's taking care of them. You notice the next verse, verse 23. Her husband's known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. Really? Now, some women may look at this in our modern day, and if you're thinking this way, shame on you. And they may say, well, she's doing all the work, and he's just sitting in the gates. Lazy rascal. Right? Nah, that's not what's there. He's a king. He's got a job. He's got a job to do. And you know what? He'll be successful if he marries this woman. Because he doesn't have to worry about getting clothes on his kids or food on the table. He gets to do his job while she does her job. Right? He's a good king because she's a she's an excellent woman. So when he's sitting in the gates, he's not sitting there lounging watching people go by. He's conducting business as a king. He's passing, hopefully, what his mama told him earlier, righteous judgment for those people coming in town. But he's able to be a good king only because he's married an excellent wife who's taking care of all these other things on his behalf. No wonder he trusts her with everything. Well, she makes linen garments and sells them. So when she was putting stuff together the night before, right? Clothes for her children, clothes for herself, making sure everyone's clothed. Obviously, she took some time to make a little extra, didn't she? And she takes that extra and she says, okay, I'm put this together. I'm going to go out and sell this rascal. And she makes them of linen. And so these garments are sold. She supplies belts to the tradesmen. She understands retail. Strength and dignity are her clothing. And she smiles at the future. If we could get across the idea today about strength and dignity to those in our culture, to women today, and I say women because we're talking about an excellent woman. I don't think that lets men off the hook by any, any uh, way at all. Strength and dignity. That's her clothing, though. 
She smiles at the future. What's she doing? She's looking down the road. The children may be little when, when they're there, but she sees down the road. Things, things look good. She, she's happy and smiling about the future, about seeing the kids grow up and get married and go have a great life and growing old with her king husband. He's been busy. She can see the fruit of it. She's looking down the road at it. Well, as we end up on verse 27, we see something else. Uh, verse 26, she opens her mouth in wisdom. Notice earlier, Mama said, open your mouth and judge righteously. That's what the king was supposed to do. And what's she supposed to do? She's supposed to open her mouth, and, or she does open her mouth in wisdom. And the teaching, or the word literally is Torah, the law of kindness, it's on her tongue. So she's opening her mouth, and when she speaks, she's godly in the way she speaks. When we talk about wisdom here, we're talking about godly wisdom. And that's what she's sharing with people. So we're looking at a woman who is strong. We're looking at a woman who is dignified. We're looking at a woman who is, is, expresses wisdom in her speech. Absolutely, the Holy Spirit knows how to define an excellent wife. Well, what are we going to do with all this? As we wrap it up, number one, I want us to remember this. Remember that this was a text that was written, really, to a young man. Young men, listen. Most of them are over here. A lot of gray heads over here. But listen. An excellent wife is, is hard to find. But if you want to be a success in life, this is the woman you're looking for. Now, nowhere in here does she claim perfection. Nor does the mother say, look for someone who's perfect. You're not going to find that. But man, this? That's pretty good. <laughs> it's excellent. Young men, look. Hard to find. May take time. I can almost guarantee it, but I'm not a prophet. But I can almost guarantee you're not going to find this woman by swiping left or swiping right. Right? Young ladies, even though this was written to young men, this is the kind of woman you want to aspire to be. Why? Because she's praiseworthy. She's worthy of, of praise. You notice what the verse says next. Her children rise up and bless her. Mom... Mom, thank you. We love you. Thank you for being this woman who works so hard. What does her husband do? He praises her saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. In our language today, I think of the song title, Nobody Does It Better. You know the Carly Simon song from a long time ago? I can say that to my wife. Ladies, this is who you want to be. An elegant, smart, benevolent giver of yourself to worthwhile, praiseworthy living. And finally... <laughs> We recognize those here who are mothers, right? New. If I do the next one and say old and point anywhere, <laughs> I'm doomed. <laughs> but we'll tuck that in the holster. <laughs> All of us here should be grateful though if we've been blessed with a godly mother that raised us this way to know how we're supposed to live
you might be here and you might say, this is thrilling, but my family life didn't look anything like that. My mother was not this person. I don't have a mother that I can look to like that. Look, young or old in here, I can tell you this. If you didn't have one, don't have one, there are enough of these women in this congregation that they will gladly pull you in and love you the way this woman did. It's deep and rich, and I could go on all day, but I know you're hungry. So let's close here by saying, let's all of us, whether we be the children, whether we be the mother, whether we be the wife, or whether we be the husband, let's try to do what, what this says, right? Let's do what it says. I hope if you are, if you're not a member of the body of Christ, I hope today's sermon give you a, a little taste of what we're striving for, what, what we're trying for. There's no one here that will claim perfection, not at all, but this is what we're striving for. Maybe you see it. Maybe you like the way it sounds, but you don't know what to do. We want to help you. We want to show you from this book what to do to be a faithful child of God. Or if you have been studying and you're ready to become a faithful child of God and this is the life you want to lead, oh, we got a nice warm baptistry back here and we're ready to help you put on Christ. If you have any needs that we can pray for or help you in any way, we'd ask that you let us know that now while we stand, while we sing.